I think there's a couple of things going on. One is the uh, the general flow into fixed income credit that we've seen over the last kind of six, seven weeks. ETFs have benefited massively from that. Uh, we've seen that in Europe, we've seen that in the US. It's investment grade, it's high yield, and over the last few weeks it's also been emerging market debt. Uh, and then alongside that, I think there's just a more structural shift towards using tools like ETFs to manage portfolios. Uh, and that's just a reality of where we are with liquidity and trading and banks, etc. And also just awareness and education. And I think it's that, that tipping point of the maturity of a lot of the, the products, which we saw in equity ETFs two, three, four years ago. I think yeah. fixed income has reached that point. Stephen, do, do you think that, that uh, investors have now become a bit more comfortable with buying credit ETFs after we had that quite crucial trading period over Christmas where mm. actually the ETFs held up much, much better than expected in terms of liquidity? Absolutely. I, it's interesting. I think there is a bit of a sea change. Um, and we see it when we go, go and talk to investors. The, the, the interest in understanding the products, understanding how to use them has definitely increased. Uh, I think the fact that we've now gone through a couple of different examples where the products have done exactly what they're supposed to do. They've been very good tools for, for accessing liquidity. Uh, the trading volumes have increased significantly in parts of high yield, for example, through these tools. I think that, that is a big, big driver for just this general awareness and general adoption comfort factor uh, that this is something I need to know about. This is something I can use if I'm managing a portfolio. Stephen, how important is volatility in bond markets at this point? And you know, aside Iceland yesterday, we've been talking about the movement in yields. It was the biggest sell-off in five months that you saw on government bonds in Iceland after the removal of of the Prime Minister yesterday. So do you look for that type of volatility in some of the trades at this point? Uh, you think you have to, I mean, to the extent that, uh, you know, we've seen that, you know, if you go back to January, early February, obviously you had a lot of volatility in parts of credit, financial corporates being a very good example, the kind of lower, the subordinated parts of the market. That's actually created a, an interesting opportunity in March to own parts of that market and we would argue still to continue to own parts of that market. So I think volatility is important. I, the challenge on the, on the other side is I think where you see volatility in the government bond side, you're actually having to do a lot of work to manage that risk. Um, and I think QE plays a big role in that. We saw that with, you know, we've seen that with JGBs, we've seen that with Bunds last year, we've seen that an element of Treasuries as well this year. What's causing the volatility? Is it event risk? Is it central bank policy? Something else? What's the big driver for a lot of this volatility you've seen in 2016? I think it's a combination. I think a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of the year around uh, the economic environment. Um, I would argue a lot of fear. Uh, that sense that we had in the first four or five weeks of the year that um, you know the Fed was trying to exit, but actually the economic data was pointing completely the opposite way. And and if we go into recession, then actually what's left to throw at throw at the global economy? That's definitely eased off over the last kind of five six weeks. I think. Within fixed income, there is less liquidity than there was five or ten years ago. So I think you have to take that into account in terms of managing portfolios. And I think QE, QE plays a big role in terms of, you know, particularly within fixed income, the way markets trade.